frame rater. So, what can be said about the Tiger GameCom portable handheld gaming system? As I've been told, the console has a bit of a history behind it. So in the beginning, God created the Game Boy and the Tiger handheld electronic game. His chosen people would be granted a blessing from Nintendo, while the other cheaper population would be cursed with the damnation of Satan himself, the one they call the Tiger. Alright, look, I have to admit, I never really thought the Tiger games were that abysmal. I mean, you never actually expected these to compare to game consoles, right? I think if you were, you were totally underestimating what these things were meant to be. On a technical level, they are ridiculously basic. Calculator stuff, really. Sure, you could say Nintendo did a much better job with their earlier Game & Watch portables, but keep in mind Nintendo was first and foremost a company for the gamers. Tiger was basically an electronics company that created entertainment. It wasn't just video games, but to an equal extent, toys. I'm sure you'll again want to compare to Nintendo, but I'm considering company roots here. Nintendo did playing cards. Besides, I'm fairly certain there was a period in time where Nintendo branded toys pretty much weren't the thing. Tiger has always had their foot in the industry. What Tiger did was take in potentially marketable ideas and sell them for a profit. This often included licensing properties from companies like Sega, Disney, Konami, then making quick little handheld games for fans to get a little on-the-go experience. These in themselves always felt more like actual toys to me than video games. I really don't think it's fair to call them video games at all. Tiger LCD video games. Oops! Eventually, it was said that these handhelds weren't selling nearly as well as they once had, so what do you do when you've got so many licensed properties in a failing market? You take it even further, I guess. Introducing Tiger's R-Zone, a sort of answer to Nintendo's Virtual Boy. And it sucked. It was a slight upgrade from their handhelds that I suppose you could now classify as video games, but very loosely. Just like their prior handhelds, you press a button and a thing happens. There's no twitch reflexes, no fast-paced gameplay. These experiences I mostly refer to as simply press a button and a thing happens. I think that's why a huge portion of the Tiger Games library were fighters. Inherently, with the style of slow-paced gaming these brought, games where you could press a button and a thing happens seems to go hand-in-hand -hand with moves in combat. I'm well aware that actual fighting games require a lot more skill and twitch movement, but I'm saying it translates better to a Tiger handheld than, say, a platformer like Sonic the Hedgehog. Not to mention, you pretty much just stay in one place, so no need for additional backgrounds or scrolling. They then made a more handheld variation of the R-Zone, which they called the R-Zone Pocket Extreme, which was... I'm inclined to think this was a slight upgrade at least. There was another called the R-Zone Super Screen, which was backlit. Hooray! So, how could they top all of this? It wouldn't take much. Nonetheless, introducing the Game.com, Game.com, Ultimate Portable Gaming System, as they would dub it. Game.com, the Ultimate Portable Gaming System. Okay, I'm now finding that was a commercial for car safety, but they stated it would change the gaming world as we know it. The Game.com would have the same general approach as their earlier Tiger games, just now on a dedicated system with better technical specs so the experience could be a step above their previous efforts. A step above is correct. A single step. One stare. Coming out in 1997, this black and white handheld would compete with the Game Boy. Yes, a console from nearly 10 years prior. Since then, we had had the Game Gear, Atari Lynx, both colored handhelds. But nope, the Gamecom was coming in to show them how it's done by coming back in black. Hell, it worked out for ACDC, so surely it'd work for Tiger, right? You know, I'm starting to notice a trend with video gaming and the use of cats in their titles. They, uh, they usually don't turn out too well. Gamecom, the ultimate portable game. Ah, uh, yes, Gamecom, the ultimate portable gay. Granted, the Gamecom was still a rather interesting device for its time. A video game console with a touchscreen. It was definitely taking notes from Palm's line of PDAs, and while those could game, they weren't really designed with that in mind. You might ask, so why the touchscreen? What does that add to the games? Honestly, as it turns out, not much. It was used almost exclusively for software with the exception of, what, two or three of its 20 game library? With additional software, you could even check your email using a web link. For what purpose? I don't know, because you could? Without turning on your computer? I guess there's some minor appeal there, but I'd much rather just wait to get on that keyboard than type on what was approximately 50 touch-sensitive zones on a 3.5-inch screen. There were also some built-in things like a game of solitaire, a calculator, a calendar. I guess that's somewhat appealing back then. Also, the calendar goes up to 2099. I thought that was kind of funny. I mean, who's going to be using a Gamecom in 2099? Interestingly enough, there were two cartridge slots designed on the Gamecom, so you could have software and a game cart inserted at the same time. You'd select them by pushing on either the left or right cartridge icon on the screen. I guess that's cool and all, but necessary? I can't think of a reason other than convenience. Way to push up the price tag. On launch, the Gamecom sold for 69 US dollars. At this point in time, you'd easily find a used or potentially new Game Boy for cheaper, with a widely expansive library, no less. 
Not to mention the existence of the Game Gear, and I mean, for those genuinely serious portable investors, you also had the options of a portable Sega Genesis or TurboGrafx-16. But the Gamecom, oh the Gamecom, was trying to market itself as a platform more aimed towards adults instead of kids. As such, a decent portion of its library was anticipated for more mature audiences. Not really by rating, but by appeal. For instance, 9 of the 20 games were either puzzlers, board games, or trivia based. Ironically, all concepts that don't necessarily require being video-oriented. The others, well, some of which being based on mature-rated titles, yes, but let's hold off on that until we get to the games. I think it's about time we delve into them anyways. So without further ado, here are the quick reviews of all 20 Tiger Gamecom games. Batman and Robin To absolutely nobody's surprise, this is an emulation of the Gamecom system. Good luck filming a Gamecom screen. Now, this emulator is very old, 1998 to be exact. Apparently, however, this is an official debugging emulator, so it's very accurate. Other than sound emulation, it has a much lower pitch than normal for most of the games. I've done my best to restore to the original pitch for those, but there may be some potential inaccuracies. That said, these games will automatically be a lot more enjoyable than if played on the actual hardware itself. Why is that? Well, the screen. The Gamecom screen is known to be dark, blurry, and worst off, it's notorious for ghosting. Any type of movement just blends in with the couple of frames in front of it, so basically every game that handles motion is almost unplayable. As would definitely be the case for Batman and Robin, however we're here to look at the games themselves. So is Batman and Robin any good? I need you to understand something with me here first, alright? Look, none of these games are quote-unquote good. In this series I judge based on sort of what you can expect from the console, if you get what I mean. Like, if I were to compare a game here to a PlayStation 4 game, I mean, come on. You gotta consider the period and time in which this was released. Of course, even in both factors, the Gamecom still has very little to show, but thankfully Batman and Robin, at least when played with a decent screen, is not bad at all. You get to choose between two classic characters, as you've already guessed, both have a set of five different abilities, two of which they can take with them on a mission. What do you do once you've started a mission? The game is just a beat em up honestly, but gives you more of a free roaming environment kind of like Rolling Thunder. How you complete a stage is a complete mystery to me, but I found after killing enough enemies a pop-up graphic would show me when it was time to move forwards. The graphics here are very good. The animations are smooth. Sound? I can't say the same though. It's really just blips, bloops, and the occasional punch or pain sound effect. <laughs> Combat is ridiculously simple, but far more engaging than any other combat the system has to offer, believe me. In fact, in terms of quality, this is no doubt the highest quality game in the Gamecom's library. It's slow, it sounds pretty bad, and honestly it's quite repetitive, but the gameplay works, and the graphics are great. So in Gamecom terms, I unfortunately have to tell you that this game is excellent. Centipede. This is a recreation of the original arcade game. It's a lot slower, but it works as it should. What you see here is exactly what you get. There's an alternative sprite sheet you can apply if you've gotten bored of the original. I wouldn't say it looks any better, it just looks different. Maybe there's a couple more pixels per entity, but it's not much. It's a bit beyond a visual upgrade. I mean, there's new Mega Mushrooms and that one fly creature from the arcade that falls down the screen, or I, I mean, maybe I didn't get far enough in the original style, but either way, this guy is introduced super fast in the second style. So in a nutshell, this is Centipede, but worse. Also, it's on the Gamecom, so for its standards, I'd say it's good, but it could have been a lot better. Duke Nukem 3D. This game is an enigma. It's just so absurd that it exists in the first place. Essentially, this is a Gamecom first-person shooter that has only one degree of view. You've heard of linear games before, but how about a game where you literally cannot turn around? In this version of the game, you can only face forward. You can move left, up, right, and down, and that's about it. How's the level design? Genuinely the worst I've ever seen for an FPS. Occasionally, you'll find yourself in a big square. The other 60% of the game is spent literally walking forward in a hallway. I'm really not making that up, this takes up a majority of the game. Not only that, but there is legitimately never a reason for you to ever walk backwards, save for a pickup you somehow pass by accident. These pickups being either weapons, some ammo, or a medkit. Oh, one time there was a keycard that opened a door near immediately next to it. To aim, either place yourself in front of an enemy or use two of the face buttons to shoot left or right if an enemy is in those corresponding directions. Strangely enough, whether I aimed at them or not, they always seem to just die anyways. This game controls very strangely, if you can imagine that. When it comes to moving forward, it often doesn't register and I have to hit the button multiple times. You'd think that to be a hardware issue, but this is being emulated. Graphics? Yeah, it has those. They're... I don't know, is this impressive? Yes? No? It's fairly sluggish and by no means does it look good. The enemies represent themselves pretty well and occasionally the walls are distinguishable, but I mean, that's basically all you've got. 
Hey, look at this here. I move left to right, and by the distance of those two frames, this poster is completely relocated. Oh yeah, Duke Nukem can speak. Bitch. Can't think of anything else to say about that one. I'm good. It's me, good boy. In terms of its sound, you got the standard trooper and pig cop death sounds, which carry on into other enemies, except for the octobrains. And just like the first time you shot an octobrain in the original Duke Nukem 3D, I was not expecting that. This is the longest you'll ever find me talking about a Gamecom game. I mean, it's a freaking first-person Duke Nukem game on one of the world's most notoriously infamous game consoles. You, t you can't underplay this. The game itself is terrible, but it's the Gamecom we're dealing with, so it's average, I guess. Fighter's Mega Mix. Supposedly this is related to Virtua Fighter. I don't know anything about this series. I'm pretty sure it's better than this, though. I like to call this one, Who Can Kick the Other One First? That's basically all you need to do to win. These might be the most technically impressive graphics for the system because there's actual background scrolling. You'll notice the theme with Gamecom games. The music consists of a couple blips and bloops that may or may not be played at random. I don't know if there's any kind of composition here, I really don't. In the game's defense, it was mildly amusing, but I'm sure that's for the wrong reasons. It's average. Frogger. Not sure whose idea it was to recreate the Atari 2600 cover of the game on the Gamecom. More specifically, why? The game uses the same kind of format as Centipede. You've got an original and remake sprite palette to swap between if you like. In terms of gameplay, it plays pretty identically to the original arcade game, even down to Frogger's massive jumps. And I always preferred the Atari port because I feel like it's easier to understand the distance of those. That's probably just me, but anyways, props to them. I figured it'd be impossible to replicate any kind of experience on the Gamecom. This feels like a Game Boy quality port. You could easily convince someone this is Game Boy footage, in fact. Had I not been making a Gamecom video, I would have assumed it was before being told. Sure, there isn't much here, but what it pulls off is excellent. Henry. I'm so confused. These pictures do not relate to their audio whatsoever. Hey there, young fella. I'm kind of scared, actually. This tomato keeps telling me I've done a good show. Good show, old chap. Maybe that has to do with throwing tomatoes at a bad performance or something, but wait, wouldn't that mean this is the complete opposite of that? Anyways, this is a game of matching. As far as I know, it's random, and you don't get to see the layout prior to it all being sprawled out in front of you. It was actually a lot of fun, though, maybe because of how absurd the sounds were, but of course that entertainment would only last one or two sit-throughs. Still, if it's randomly selected each time, then there is some semblance of fun here. It's something to do when waiting for your meal to arrive after your parents ordered for you. Anyways, this game is great for Gamecom standards. I have to cut it here, though, because my meal came and it's talking to me. Send help. Hey, watch it, pal. Indy 500. This might actually top Supercross 3D on Jaguar as the worst game I've ever played. There's only so many buttons on the Gamecom and none of them drift. I swear there is only accelerate and turn. You can swap perspective from behind the car to third person, and if you don't think there's anything special about that, then you should probably avoid Indy 500 on the Gamecom. Actually, no, regardless of that, just avoid this altogether. I can't stop crashing and there's nothing I can do about it. That damn spin is drilled into my brain. Get it out, get it out. Jeopardy. This is the one game of the library that doesn't work on the emulator. At least I couldn't get it to. It's said to be very playable in some MAME build that runs Gamecom games, but MAME to my experience is always such a pain to get working properly. I tried to set that up, but as per usual, none of the games whatsoever showed up, so I'm resorting to this video I found online by YouTuber PetSassGym1. That's quite a name you've picked there. Now usually I don't give games that I can't play a rating, but I'm 99% sure I get the picture in this case. Basically, if you're not intelligent, you can't play Jeopardy on the Gamecom. But even if you are intelligent, you can't play Jeopardy on the Gamecom because no intelligent person would ever consider playing this on the Gamecom. But I'll give it credit for what it is. Correct. Lights Out. This was a handheld game before coming to the Gamecom as a console pack-in. Or maybe it came slightly later, I don't know. Anyways, you have a set of options, but these all contribute directly to a game of press the light to turn it off. Except it works in strange patterns that I could never fully understand. My sister was always really good at this, so I know that you can get a grip on it. Certain presses work under certain circumstances. If you can figure it out, then good for you. You know, this never really had a reason to be a video game. Just play the original handheld. It's good, I guess. I'd be lying if I said it was no fun anyways. The Lost World Jurassic Park. I did some research on this one and it seems absolutely nobody knows how to play it. 
You start off with a choice of two characters and vehicles that I don't think affect the game whatsoever. Dinosaurs will chase you as you move forward. How do you avoid them? I don't think you can. Then the game shortly after places you in a platforming adventure where you have a few special actions to activate at will, much like Batman and Robin in that sense. You can tranquilize dinos and do something with this gadget, I don't know. The objective is to make it to the end of the stage and collect the mama dino's eggs. Because I guess you're just rude like that. You gotta jump from tree to tree to make it through the jungle and wow, I mean this guy just does not want to make any height. I think he's scared of them to be honest. But I personally would prefer to be in the trees with that dino constantly walking around in the background. And that visual is pretty much the most entertainment you'll get out of this one. Wasted potential, or maybe not since I see no potential in a game being on the Gamecom in the first place. It's bad. Monopoly. I think it'd be pretty hard to screw up a board game in video form, and that's probably why these concepts are familiar to the Gamecom. That being said, the presentation of Monopoly here is actually fairly decent when looking past the console it's being played on. With actual animations and a proper representation of the Monopoly board game, I can't really look at it other than excellent for what it is. Mortal Kombat Trilogy. I've played Mortal Kombat games in the past but always failed spectacularly because I don't know any of the special moves. You got this character Motaro unlocked from the beginning. Again, I'm not overly familiar, but I'm pretty sure a guy like this wouldn't be unlocked immediately. No? Anyways, this game is pretty hard. I only managed to win once, but can you really blame me? I mean, besides the graphics, this just doesn't play well at all. They at least managed to fit the announcer voice in there, with three or so audible lines. Maybe this needs a more thorough analysis to determine its overall quality, but I don't think any Mortal Kombat fans are dying to play this nor defend it from a bad rating, so maybe I'm wrong with this one, but I'm gonna go for it anyways. Quiz Wiz Cyber Trivia If you've ever seen the Gamecom marketing, you'll find it was a bit patronizing. The same can be said in playing a game of Quiz Wiz where this dude on screen just seems to be there to make fun of you. No brainer! But otherwise it's a game of multiple choice with a very unappealing font. You've got a choice of five different categories to choose from. Sports, famous people, film and TV, pop 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 Well done. Resident Evil 2. People love to crap on this port because it's on the Gamecom. Rightfully so, it's awful, but it's also great because it's on the Gamecom. Yes, it's true, on first play you'll die instantly because you have no idea how it controls, but then, like, just start over, dude. No problem. After that, you're greeted with a fairly enjoyable, obviously trimmed down Resident Evil game. Compare this to the likes of Java Phone games at the time. In fact, do that for each and every game on the Gamecom. This really isn't that bad. There's even an inventory system that works? By no means should you really go out to play this, but at the time it came out, I could see some mild entertainment coming from this. The graphics in particular are very well done for Gamecom terms. I guess that isn't much of an accomplishment, though. It feels like a little heart was put into this one. I actually died several minutes into it and wanted to try again. That is leagues beyond what I could say for any other game on this platform. For that alone, this game is worthy of the great label. Scrabble. I don't think you could screw up Scrabble, but for a formula so simple you couldn't do better than this? You got three points of view. Far away, close, or Jesus, back up! Really? All I wanted was a simple zoom. That goes from a zero to a ten instantly. Other than that, it's just Scrabble like you remembered it. Gotta say, very bad presentation. Overall, average. Sonic Jam. This is the most hilarious example of music on the Gamecom, because if you really pay close attention, you'll find that they're actually terrible renditions of existing classic Sonic tracks. What's this one sound like to you? Guess what stage they put flying battery music in? Mushroom Hill Zone. Even better, the track for Mushroom Hill Zone exists, and it plays in Sonic 2, an entirely different game. Speaking of which, besides a couple things like associated stage graphics and specific enemy types, these levels are entirely original, and that's a bad thing in this case. The most impressive thing about it is the fact that this elevator works. Like, actually, this impressed me with the quality of the rest of the game. Also, each of the three included games are supposedly very short. I didn't play long enough to tell, I, I just couldn't. If you want a thorough analysis of this game, there are a couple videos out there already. It's just terribly slow, the camera is one of the worst I've ever had to deal with, and the controls make no sense. This is just such an outlandishly offensive rendition of a Sonic game that I just can't look at it any longer. It's bad, it's bad, oh it's awful! Just wanted to throw this in here because I've never heard anybody talk about it. I was looking for the cover art and I happened to stumble across a bunch of very interesting screenshots that showed 
a demonstration of what the game was like before it was released, which looked a lot more similar to the actual classic games. Now, by no means do I think this would have been good. Maybe they intended to put more work into it, but then realized the game comp sucks, and so they just threw together what they had. I mean, just looking at these screens, Sonic 3D Blast was apparently planned, I guess. Tiger Casino. Someone really, I mean, really put some effort into the animations here. Almost like they spend most of their time working on the game on these animations. I mean, who would really want to make games for this other than... Wait. Tiger Casino. Even the developers of the damn system don't care! Tiger. Okay, not entirely true. All I'm saying is the games themselves are very simple. How much work could you really have put into these to make them as functional as they are? It's entirely presentation over performance. But that said, it is a casino game. After all, I don't have much interest or even a knowledge of how these games are played. I assume they play just fine, as they're supposed to. There's a decent variety of games here, too. Alright, yes, I initially made it sound horrible, but I just don't think there's much room for error with such a thing. If anything, you could say they wasted time making this when instead they could have made another, more interesting game that people would actually want to play. I guess it's great. Didn't have to do much to be, though. It's honestly really hard to rate games like this. Wheel of Fortune So in traditional Wheel of Fortune, you're supposed to have 24 possible landings on the wheel. This one has half that amount, but all the penalties are still there. Bankrupt, lose a turn, they're far more common as a result. I sometimes got two bad landings in a row. The game is fun, I suppose, but I thought Tiger already had pretty much a monopoly on Wheel of Fortune handouts. I mean, these things were everywhere. Even my technologically inept grandmother had one. Would you believe she's in her 90s? My genetics say I'm gonna be around for a long time, and I don't know why I'm wasting it playing this junk. But at least, this isn't a bad game in Gamecom terms, it's just good. I feel like a lot of the appeal is the dopamine hit once you've scored a big fortune, but you can't really do that as often here. Wheel of Fortune 2 Near exactly the same as Wheel of Fortune 1, just a different selection of questions, I guess. And I know this is a different game because it has a different intro screen graphic. Uh, same rating? Williams Arcade Classics Well, amidst a crappy library, at least you've got a couple arcade classics. Centipede and Frogger were decent. How bad could this be? Answer? Far beyond your wildest imaginations. I'd go ahead and say the only playable of the five games on here are Defender 1 and 2. And even then, why would you? It looks similar enough, I guess, but the frame rate is poor, the sound is almost non-existent, and... I know we're not considering the Gamecom screen for this video, but just imagine a game with the speed of Defender being played on that ghost-ridden thing? I don't think it'd be possible, like, at all. What definitely isn't possible is enjoying a good game of Joust because you can't play a good game of Joust on here. You can indeed press buttons and things happen, that's kind of the best I can say for it. You can push the hop button, but you can't push it fast enough to jump out of harm's way. You can move, but really slowly. Sinistar, I swear, is only included in this package because of the other Williams Arcade collections having this specific lineup. This is, like Joust, pretty much unplayable. The frame rate chugs harder than an alcoholic, and the actual objective of collecting Cinnabombs takes far too long. It also takes far too long for the Sinistar to actually start chasing you and- Oh, oh, there he is. Yep. Very menacing. Wow. And Robotron, of course. Also makes no sense being here. A twin-stick shooter? Seriously? So the dude you play as runs at breakneck speed for some reason, despite everything else moving at the usual pace. Shooting your lasers is done entirely by the face buttons. Awkwardly. The four Gamecom buttons are at an angle, mind you, so it would take a lot of adjusting to even understand how to do this. Yeah, this is just awful. Don't play it. So what did I think of the Tiger Gamecom library? It sucks, don't play it. Eventually there was a second model of the Gamecom called the Pocket Pro, which improved a couple things but removed some others. Newly introduced is the visibility of the screen by introducing backlighting. It used only two AA batteries compared to the earlier four, and was priced at $30 instead of $69. There was no more second cartridge slot or internet connectivity. Also, it's said to be much smaller, but I've never seen one before in real life, so I can't really be the judge of that. This thing would have had a much better chance of selling had it gone with this approach in the first place, instead of adding a bunch of useless gimmicks that probably nobody used in the first place. But what am I talking about? The Gamecom itself is a useless gimmick that probably nobody played in the first place. And yet it still outsold the Atari Jaguar by at least 50,000 units at 300,000 sold. What? By no means a success, but 300,000 people bought a Gamecom? Why? Ultimately, the Gamecom was discontinued not even a year after its second model was released. I suppose nobody had any interest in the Gamecom to even justify a $30 price tag. Fair enough. I don't think I have to explain that one any further. In conclusion, Gamecom. The ultimate portable gay. Finally, now I never have to think about this stupid monstrosity ever again. 
Hope you enjoyed. See you frame raiders in the next blah blah blah. Don't play Gamecom.